Romans chapter 1 and verse 7. Your text that we're starting with tonight. Paul writes to the church at Rome. He said, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your love and your care for us. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that we can gather in your house and we can hear from your word. And that you have given to us all things that are necessary for our faith and practice. That you sent the Lord Jesus Christ to be our Savior, to be our Redeemer. That he died on the cross of Calvary, taking our sin debt, raising again the third day for our justification, ever seated at your right hand, making intercession for us. We thank you for the intercessory ministry of our Savior. We thank you for his headship of the church. We thank you that all things are, have been appointed unto Christ and he's the heir of all things and we are joint heirs with him. We thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit who also intercedes on our behalf, who teaches us all things concerning the scripture, reveals to us our need and helps us to walk through this life. And we pray that the ministry of the Holy Spirit help us to understand your word this evening. And we thank you for all these things that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You all may be seated. We're considering tonight of chapter 26 of the Second London Baptist Confession of the Church. And in paragraph 6, which is titled, The Power of Christ is Active Instituting, and that reference of instituting to that of the church. And uh, in this chapter, as we've mentioned before, to just help keep the big picture in mind, and uh, paragraphs 1 through 4 dealt with the invisible and visible aspects of the church. And then in, here in paragraphs 5 through 13 compose the second part, which deals with Christ's headship of the church. And we've considered in paragraph 5, uh, under this idea of the power of Christ, his act of calling and and from, chapter, uh, from paragraph 5 down to paragraph 13, all these can be uh, understood under the concept of the power of Christ. Uh, in paragraph 6, his act of instituting. And I know that this gets to be a little bit of a grocery list, but I think it helps uh, us seeing the full picture. Uh, his act of order, his act of government, his act of appointing officers, uh, the uh, ministerial support, uh, that of gifted brethren, the exercise of discipline, and the presence of Christ in discipline. And then the third part of this chapter deals in paragraph 14 and 15, uh, deals with that of church association. How is it that local visible assemblies are to be properly related one to another? So in this idea that we're considering tonight, the power of Christ is active instituting, there's two points that we want to consider tonight. First, that of the identity of the people Christ calls. The identity of the people Christ calls. And then secondly, the acts of the people Christ calls. The acts of the people Christ calls. So this paragraph in particular uh, deals with the idea that, again, Christ is active Lord. The ascended Lord implements the eternal plan of God. It is Christ who is the uh, one who has been given all these things to bring about in reality that God the Father has given to him. And so in the active part of that eternal plan of God is the instituting of his church. If we remember from those teachings of dispensationalism, it's, uh, they teach that the church is an accident. Uh, that the church is plan B. Uh, that because the Jews did not accept Christ as their Redeemer, God had to come up with a new plan, and the new plan was the church. And that's not the case at all. But we understand that the church has always been the plan of God. That God has always had a people that He's called unto Himself. That He's constituted as a visible uh, representative of His body on this earth. And so we have to identify the people of Christ that He calls. And these... And who, you know, the idea is who are these people 
that Christ uses to institute His church. Then secondly, or lastly, and this acts of the people Christ calls, what are the things uh, the call of Christ do to, in the institution of the church? So we consider this identity of the people Christ calls, we know that, first of all, the saints are by calling. And uh, again in Romans 1 and verse 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That idea of calling in the New Testament is not merely that of saying, we're calling this thing a chair, we're calling that thing a table, we're calling this over here an automobile. No, it's the idea of calling. Come here. Come unto me. That's the idea of calling. And so Christ, when He calls His saints, He's calling them unto Himself. He's calling us to be in His presence. To be believers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, Paul also right in the church at Corinth. He states this, he said, Under the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. How is it then that the, the church is made up of saints? Because those are the ones whom God, who the Lord Jesus Christ calls to be His church. Called to be saints. You know, this, the idea of the Roman Catholic Church is that you have to do a certain number of miracles and acts. And then, uh, if you remember, the, if you ever heard the term devil's advocate, that's a Roman Catholic idea. That when they decide to saint somebody, they bring in the devil's advocate and they try to drag up all, all the trash and all the vileness they can find on the person to make a case against why they shouldn't be a saint. That's not anywhere nearly remotely biblical. If we are born again, we are the saints of God. We are called to be holy unto Him. And so by effectual calling, we are called saints. And so these are the people that identify as the body of Christ. Those who are saints. And this is important for Baptist understanding of the church because... I'm going to get ahead of myself uh, on a lot of things here to mention this, but the reality is that we as Baptists say that only those who are born again can be members of the church. Because those are the saints. And not, not infants, not, not uh, sprinkled infants or baptized infants, however you want to call it, not just because the, the child, uh, just because the parents are Christians does not automatically make the children Christians. Though that uh, godly parents still have the responsibility to raise their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. But when that child is old enough and they make a profession of faith and then they can be rightfully and properly added to the assembly. But also this visible... Uh, this identity of the people Christ calls, there's a visible demonstration of obedience. In Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, and verse 9 and 10, For if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so there's a visible demonstration of obedience. In order to be a Christian, the very first act is to submit to the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. That He is indeed Lord and Savior. And in doing so, a profession of faith accompanies that visible obedience. How, how is it that we become Christians? By calling upon the name of the Lord. That's the very first act of obedience. To be confronted with the Gospel and being, said, and being told that we are sinners condemned guilty before God and the only remedy uh, to that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first step of the Christian life is obedience. 
Now that's not minimizing faith and repentance and regeneration and all the other aspects that go into salvation. But to understand that obedience to the Word of God is the first step. And we would list all the other things that go with the Gospel also. Calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And so there's a visible demonstration of obedience. Somebody, in order to be called a saint, we have to be called of God and respond to the call of God. Without that, a person is not saved. A person cannot will themselves to be saved. They can't just roll out of bed one day and go, you know what, I think I'm just going to be a Christian now. I mean, they can make that decision, but if there's no repentance, they're no more saved than they were before they rolled out of bed. And so there is this idea that, that saints are called by Christ and they also demonstrate visible obedience to Christ. So what are the acts of these people Christ calls? These ones who are born again saints. Well, how, do, how do we take a group of born again saints and make that a visible body of Christ? How do we identify and say, Victory Baptist Church, those who have, those who have joined that assembly are Christ's visible representation on earth, and not just everybody who just walks in the door. And there's some there is some aspects to this. If you go with me to Acts chapter one, Acts chapter one, and verse fourteen and fifteen, and uh, we find that uh, that the first thing is that there's a willing consent to walk together according to Christ's appointment. There's a willing consent to walk together according to Christ's appointment. In Acts chapter one, verse fourteen. These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, and notice a little parenthesis here, it's very important. The number of the names together were about 120. The very first church had a rule book. Not R-U-L-E, but R-O-L-L. They had a rule book. They knew who were the members. And so, and who was in attendance. And so Luke, Dr. Luke being a historian and writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's up there with Paul in Jerusalem and he, he's doing some research and he pulls out this, the rule book and he says, oh look, oh, there's about 120 people there on the day of Pentecost. The church knows who its members are. The church knows who are consented together as a voluntary society. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 41 and 42, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were, now notice, were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So Luke says, well, here's before the day of Pentecost, it's about 120. After that, here's 3,000 more people. They were added to the church rule. If you use a church clerk, you're going to have a very busy day that day. But it would be a blessed day. In verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. The local New Testament assembly is a voluntary association, but it is still an association. It's still an assembly. Acts chapter 5 and verse 13 and 14. Acts chapter 5 and verse 13 and 14. And of the rest, there's no man joined. Let me back up to verse 12. By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Now, this is after Ananias and Sapphira died. And uh, verse 13, And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them, and believers the more added, uh, and believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes both of men and women. So what happens in that first church? 
Ananias and Sapphira, they lie and then they die. And when, they, when that happens, everybody else says, you know, I don't know if I want to join with them people because if I have to be found out to be a liar, I might be dying. You know, what's the famous phrase that we hear down here in the South? If I'm a lion, I'm a dying. Well, I think it comes from Acts chapter 5. And, but what happens though? People magnify the Lord because God exercised discipline in the church. But then those who were sincere and believed God were added to the assembly. They still joined that church. And so the church is a voluntary society. And the Baptist church and conscious and, and, and distinction with that of a state church, in a state church, you are automatically enrolled in the state church at birth. You have no choice. Uh, you, know, you, you know, in England, in, the, in those days of the time of the writing of the Confession of Faith, uh, when you were born and you were baptized, you're Christianized, you're given a Christian name, your name was entered into the rule book of the church, and you, that was your birth record and your membership into, that, into the state church. Nobody asked you if you wanted to be a member. You're automatically a member. And the same goes for that of the Roman Catholic Church and that of some of the Reformed churches in, uh, that follow after the Catholic Church by baptizing infants. They're automatically added to the role of the church. There is no voluntary consent. It's involuntary. And of course, they would, they would say, well, that's because that's what God's commanded. And we would most wholeheartedly disagree with that. Everywhere we find people joining the assembly of the church and the book of Acts and other places is because of voluntary, voluntary consent. They wanted to join. No one held a gun to their head. No one uh, threatened them with bodily harm. No one arm wrestled them. They joined because the Holy Ghost moved with compunction in their heart to assemble with the church. And that's a, a statement that has to be remembered because, you know, unfortunately, we live in a day of commercial enterprise. And I'm, I'm perfectly fine with capitalism, but I don't think that commercialism belongs in the church. I don't believe that consumerism belongs in the church. God has called the church to be different than the world. The world will try to arm wrestle you to buy their product. Brand A is better than brand B. And brand C comes along and says, no, look, brand A does this and brand B does this, but brand C, we're the best. And they'll use every marketing trick and manipulation tactic to get you to buy their product. But that's not so with the church. The Holy Ghost adds members to the church. And if the Holy Ghost can't get them to join the church, and the Holy Ghost can't get them to get saved, then you and I are going to have a lot of hard trouble trying to do that on our own. No, it's the Holy Ghost who compels the person to, in obedience to the Word of God to be assembled together with God's people. It's a voluntary society. But also these acts of the people that Christ calls is in relation to God and one another. And we think of the two great commandments over in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37 through 40. Matthew 22 verse 37 through 40. Now in the context in verse 35 and 36, a lawyer asked him a question excuse me, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Those two commandments are the greatest commandments. That's the cornerstone of the law and the prophets. 
to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and uh, with all thy soul and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And so the rest of the law, if I can put it this way, is commentary. It's how do we fulfill those two laws? But see, our relation is to God and one another. That we must give ourselves to the Lord and give ourselves to one another. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 5. And Paul writing of, of the church at Macedonia in verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, we, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed in the church of Macedonia. How then a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we should receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. And in verse 5, And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. And so what is it then for the church as it assembles together? It becomes this visible assembly of called saints that voluntarily associate together. That first of all, we have to give ourselves unto the Lord. And there's a great this misconception and again I just mentioned about the consumerism and the materialism that's crept into our churches this idea that when someone comes by and they say now what does your church have to offer what is your church uh, what programs do you have and what they're and the rest of the question is what can what are you doing better than everybody else in the community why should I come here and put and put my uh, and sit in your church pew and put my money in your offering plate, what benefit do I get from it? That's what they're really asking. How, what, what is the bang for my buck? But see, why do they ask that question? Because they haven't given themselves to the Lord first. If we give ourselves to the Lord first, then what we find is that we can do the will of God wherever He places us. We will, we will love the Lord with all our heart, our soul, and our mind. We'll love Him with our hands. We'll love Him with those things that we do. And because of that, wherever God places us, we will then be content. Because we're doing, we are giving ourselves unto the Lord first. But then what else we to do? We're give ourselves to one another. The church functions as a body. We know from 1 Corinthians where Paul talks about if all the church were an eye, if all the church were an ear, if all the church is a hand, it's that words, you know, all those other things. But no, we're a body. We all work together. It's required for the assembly. But see, the, the Holy Ghost is the master of assembly. The Holy Ghost is the, the architect. He's the craftsman. And He's the one who's fitting the, the living stones together into the body of Christ. And He says, I want this one over here and place this one over here and we're going to have this arch window here and all these things fit together. And because of that, the church then functions as it ought to by the power of the Holy Ghost. And so when people are more concerned about those things and what they can get out of the church, then the church becomes an entertainment, materialistic, uh, consumer-driven operation. Because then it's about trying to attract the craft. And so the answer I give when people come and say, what does, your, what does your church have to offer? The answer is the Bible. That's what we have to offer. The Word of God. I like what Ian Paisley said one time. He said, he said I have no other plan, no other program, but the preaching of God's Word. And if we would be focused on worshiping the way we ought to, 
then all of this consumerism stuff would all go by the wayside in our society. Why? Because we'd be first giving ourselves unto the Lord and His Word, and then we would give ourselves one to another. And these are the two great commandments. And so this idea of the acts of the people Christ calls a willing consent to join together, uh, then also in relation to God and one another, giving ourselves to the Lord and giving ourselves to one another. But then thirdly, in subjection to the gospel ordinances. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 13. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ, for your liberal distri- distribution unto them and to all men. Now Paul is talking to the church at Corinth about their offering that they're supposed to send to Jerusalem. But what we want to focus on for the sake of our uh, consideration this evening is right there in the middle of the verse he says, uh, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ. We are to be subject unto the gospel of Christ. And how do we exercise that? How is that demonstrated? Well, first of all, we've already talked about obedience to the gospel itself. Calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. But then secondly, that of Baptism. Now we understand that what we call is credo baptism. It's believer's baptism. Baptism. Credo is a Latin word that means I believe or I confess. So it's believer's baptism. Only those who conf- can confess the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior can be baptized. Which is different than paedo baptism. Paedo being a child. Uh, so you have pediatrician, and the idea is a child's doctor. So paleo baptism says that we just baptize babies, and they become members of the church without confession. So how does a baby? How does an infant? How is it subject to the gospel? How is it declaring its obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ? As far as I know, children cannot. Little babies cannot. Why? Because we have to have an awareness of that who of who God is and our sinful condition. So it's not uncommon to hear children four or five, maybe, being being saved. Sometimes older. Sometimes uh, people as adults. Why? Because it requires believing the gospel. So after believing the Gospel comes baptism. But also that of the Lord's Supper. Now, now only the, I found out it's only the most extreme Presbyterians give paleo communion. So we talk about paleo baptism, baptizing infants. But there are some who also give communion to infants and there are some who withhold the communion from infants because they say, well, the child really can't participate in understanding what communion is, the Lord's Supper is. And I go, well, and I think to myself, well, then how does the child understand baptism then? How does the infant understand baptism? So if a Presbyterian is going to be consistent, which we would hope they would, and they, they label us with inconsistency, so it goes both directions. But if they were going to be consistent with their belief that a baby, an infant, can worship God uh, and be baptized, then they should also allow the child to partake in the Lord's Supper. So as a Baptist, we say that you have to be born again, you have to be baptized, and then you can participate or jo- uh, in joining the church, then you can participate in the Lord's Supper. And it's that order for the New Testament church. So, a believer is to be in subjection to the Gospel. What else does it mean to be in subjection to the Gospel? We're just saying that a person must only just be born again and baptized and a member of the church and then they can have the Lord's Supper. But what else? 
Is there more? Yes, there actually is. If we go to John chapter 14 and verse 15. John chapter 14 and verse 15. And what we find here in these verses that we'll look at is that the Gospel of Christ also means following all of Christ's commandments. John 14 and verse 15, If ye love Me, keep My commandments. And verse 21, He that hath My commandments and keepeth them, he is that he, he it is that loveth Me, and he that loveth Me shall be loved of My Father, and I will love him and will manifest Myself to him. And then John 15 and verse 10, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. What does it mean then to be in subjection to the Gospel of Christ? It's believing the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. It's following Him in believers' baptism. It's assembling with the local church. It's participating in the Lord's Supper but it's also our daily life of walking with Christ and keeping His commandments. Now we, and let me be clear to say that what I'm not saying is that in order for a person to be considered born again, they have to do all these things. Salvation is by faith alone. Without works, but by faith. But because of the faith that God has given to us, and because we have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, works should follow that faith. If you look with me in Ephesians chapter 2, and verse 8 down to verse 10, Ephesians chapter 2, and verse 8 through 10, notice, For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so what we're simply saying is that by being in obedience to the Gospel, that that Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that living Head of the church, the One who has saved us from our sin, who has regenerated us by the power of the Holy Ghost, there should be a difference in our life. There should be good works that follow our conversion. And then we should be in subjection to the Gospel of Christ that we keep His commandments. And over in 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, First John chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Christ is our great pattern. Christ is our great example. And Christ tells us if we keep His commandments, that demonstrates that we love Him. How is it that we love God? Well, John also points out that out in 1 John 4 and verse 10. Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And in verse eight, He said, "He that loveth not knoweth. Uh, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love." And the reality is that we only know love because God has given to us love to start with. And how we reciprocate the love that God has given to us is by our obedience to Christ. So when somebody says, well, God knows the heart. And God knows my heart. Well, yes. And if you read carefully 1 Samuel, I believe it's chapter 15 or 16, where God told Samuel that he, to reject the oldest born of Jesse, he said, because I have looked upon his heart and I have rejected him. It's amazing how people separate that out of the verse. They just want that first part where it says, God looks upon the heart. But God goes on and tells Samuel, the prophet Samuel, because I, I have rejected him. And so when someone says, well, God knows my heart. Yes, he does. And he also knows that that person is often using that as an excuse for their disobedience. 
It's amazing uh, that how worldly, carnal Christians will say, as, as soon as you start saying, well, Christ said to do this, and Christ said to do that. Now again, we're not making this tied to salvation. Right? We're saying that these things follow salvation. And so a Christian ought to do this, and he ought to do that, or not to do this, and the first thing is, they jump up and say, that's legalism! Well, they might be disappointed one day when they stand before Christ and find out that was what Christ commanded after all. Peter tells us in his epistle, Be ye holy, for I am holy. He's quoting out of the Leviticus. Because God is holy. And when we understand the holiness of God and we understand who we are, we realize that we'll never be too holy in this lifetime. We'll never arrive at a place where we go, oh, oops, I didn't mean to be so holy there. No, God's holiness is infinite. And Christ saved us out of our depravity. And so any progress we make in holiness is right progress in the right direction. And the, the reality is this. The closer we walk with Christ, the more we see our own sinfulness. It's like when you take a light. And, and, and so say so you go down to Goodwill or to the thrift store and you see this cup sitting there, it's mug, coffee cup, right? And you pick it up and you look at it and you go, hey, that don't look too bad. It's a little dusty, you know. Throw it in the shopping cart, roll up to the counter, pay your 25 cents, and, home, and here comes your new coffee mug coming home. Get it home. You throw it, you read, you read the bottom, it says dishwasher safe, you throw it in the dishwasher, get all the dirt knocked off of it, and you pull it out and you go, oh, there's a couple cracks in the enamel on this thing. And you go, oh, okay, and you put it up in the cabinet, and you get it out, and it's a nice, bright, shiny day, and maybe you stand in the kitchen window before you pour your, pour your cup of coffee, you go, oh, there's some blemishes in this. And you look it over, and you, and you get it in a better light, and you go, there's some nicks and scrapes and think why? Because the more you expose something to light, the more you see faults. They're easier to find. And as we expose ourselves more and more to the holiness of God, the more and more we see our own faults. And so, as Paul said that he had not arrived. And if Paul the Apostle under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit could say that He hadn't arrived uh, and perfection in this world, then none of us, I believe, could say that we've arrived. And I've always been troubled by the fact when a Christian comes and says to me, I'm spiritually mature. I now want to run the other direction. When I hear those words, why? Because re the reality is we'll never be spiritually mature as Christ is. We'll never be as holy as Christ. And I believe that the more that we fellowship with Christ, the more we try to keep His commandments, the more we attempt to love Him more and more and, and enjoy that fellowship with Christ, the more that we realize how sinful we really are and how far yet we need to go. And yet we can rejoice in the grace of God that we have an advocate with the Lord Jesus advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And so our goal then is to live according to the Gospel. That those things of, of obviously being born again is the entrance into the Christian life. If you read Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan goes for a little ways describing uh, Pilgrim's sinfulness and how he's leaving the city of destruction. And then he finally makes it to the wicked gate. And he enters into that narrow path. And the burden falls off. But that's only the first part of the book. What is the rest of Pilgrim's progress about? It's about Pilgrim's walk with the Lord until he exits this world and enters into the celestial city.
And so for the Christian, being born again is obviously the first step. And the next few steps is very simple. It's believer's baptism, joining the local assembly, being able to participate in the Lord's Supper. But that's not all there is to the Christian life. The rest of it is walking in obedience to God's Word according to the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that demonstrates our love for God. And we live in a world today where it's almost easy now to be different than the world. The world has actually made it quite easy for us to be different. Because of all the sinfulness and the vice that abounds. And it's, it would be simple for Christians just to stand up and say, you know, I'm not going along with that. But what do we find much to our own dismay? That the church is following hard on the heels of the world. But let us remain faithful in following Christ. Because... Christ is the one who's redeemed our soul. Christ is the one who's saved us from our sin. Christ is the one who's gained our entrance into heaven for us. And He's worthy of all our praise and all our adoration. He's worthy of all our obedience to Him. So we've considered this evening the identity of the people Christ calls. The saints become the church. They assemble together. And the acts of those people that Christ calls, they willingly consent to walk together in, the, uh, in our relation to God and one another, but also subject to the ordinances of the Gospel. And so the true, in conclusion, the true head of the church is the headship of Christ. He is the one appointed by the Father and all powers given to Christ. And in this power, He calls out of the world saints whom in turn He calls to institute his church. But also then lastly, the saints assemble in local visible assemblies to carry out the plan and purpose of God in this world. That's a wonderful thing that God has done. And I'm so thankful that the church is not an afterthought on God's part. That it wasn't plan B. That when Christ died on the cross of Calvary, it was to call for Himself a people to be assembled. And for us here in 2024, yeah, I think yeah, it's 2024, 2024, that we're not here by accident. We're not, we're not a surprise to God. But we're part of His eternal counsel and purpose in this world. And that we can participate in the plan of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again we Thank You for Your love and Your care for us. We thank You for Your goodness and Your mercy. We thank You for Your long-suffering and Your kindness to us. We thank You, Lord, that You have called us unto Yourself. That we can be the visible assembly of Your saints. And we thank You, Lord, that You do have a plan in this world and that You're carrying it out. And we rejoice, Lord, that we've been called at such a time as this to be, <coughs> to be faithful to those things that You've called us to and we can see your work in this world. And Lord, we thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.